So CK is that coefficient. It's going to be, I don't know if we've used this derivative notation before, over n factorial. So this f with a little n in parentheses means take n derivatives. So obviously, if you're taking the fifth derivative, it's a little silly to write derivative, the little single quote version of derivative. So where fn of x is d over dx n times f of x. So we're taking n derivatives of the function. So there'll be d, d dx, d dx, d dx, d dx, d dx, n times. So there'll be the nth derivative. And of course, we're going to plug in a. So whatever number a is, we're going to plug that number in. So you generally want to center your series at a nice number. That's why zero is used a lot. It's a nice number. One is used depending on what you're using. Sometimes you'll center it at e if there's a natural log, for example. So you're going to center. Well, you're, the problems you'll do, you generally center them at whatever number I tell you to center them at. But if you're going to pick numbers, you would pick uh, either a nice number, or if you know you want to approximate at values close to 15, you would use 15 as your A. We have done degree one Taylor series before. So we've done degree one Taylor series before. It's called linearization. So degree one Taylor series. Degree one Taylor series is called linearization. And that was f of x. The approximation was f at a plus f prime of a times x minus a. So you might remember this. This is a linearization at a. That was way back, I think it was chapter four, probably 3.9. Oh, I was really close. We'll round up. So 3.9, linearization. So Taylor series, how does it change this? Well, if you take infinite derivatives and have an infinite series added together, you actually get that it will be equal to fa plus f prime a x minus a plus f double prime a x minus a squared divided by 2 factorial plus f triple prime a times x minus a cubed over 3 factorial etc 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 so this is if you go forever you will have equality with f of x. Now, of course, practically, you can't go forever, even if you have a lot of motivation. You're never going to get an infinite number of terms. So you go out far enough, and you'll have a very good approximation. So the further out you go, the better your approximation is going to be. We're not going to go into measuring how far out you need to go to get certain levels of accuracy but that's called the error amount. So how far away from the actual function will your estimate be? So that's called uh, the error. So we're not going to worry about computing the error. Uh, there's no factorial over here, but I could write it as divide by 1 factorial, divide by 0 factorial. Remember, 0 factorial is 1 itself, so I didn't change anything by dividing those two terms. I just showed you the pattern. Uh, now, here you could think there's a zero derivative, which means take zero derivatives, also known as don't take a derivative, so just f of a. So that follows the derivative pattern also. I don't want to write f little parentheses zero derivatives here. But that'll be zero derivatives, first derivative, second, third, etc. And we're going to call this t 
A of X. So T is for Taylor, A is for the uh, value A that you took. So the T is for Taylor. A series about x equals a. And of course, it's an infinite series, so you can find the nth derivative term. So for a lot of functions, you could write out what the summation would look like as a sigma notation. But in terms of computation, the only ones we really know is if it's a geometric series, geometric power series, we can get the actual values in there. Or if there is some way that the finite sums, you could have, you could take a limit of those. So we saw a couple finite sums that converged. Or I should say the limits of finite sums that converged, the telescoping. But generally, finding the sum of just a general infinite series is not uh, possible, unless it's a very nice form. So most things are not very nice forms. So most of them, you can just write them down, and you could get the first thousand terms, and a lot of times that's close enough. This is how your calculator, when you ask it for a sign of something like 1, 1 is not a nice uh, angle for trig function. So how does it get sign of 1? Well, it approximates it the way that we'll approximate it with the Taylor series. And however many decimals uh, accuracy your calculator has, it just goes that far out. So I think we're ready for examples. Oh, that's not good. All right. So we'll try to find the generic Taylor series. If that looks too hard, we'll just find the first uh, three terms. We'll probably be good enough uh, to see the pattern happening. So find Taylor series 4, f of x as 1 over x. You could write as x and negative first. You're going to be taking derivatives. Just looking at this, what would be a bad x value to expand around? Zero would be bad. Because think about what do your derivatives look like. They're basically going to be 1 over x to the n power. They're going to be a constant. But each derivative would be undefined at 0. So that would be a really bad x value to choose. So the next best one. We could do 1. That would work. Let's just go with 2. So let's find t2 of x. So that'll be summation n equals 0 to infinity of, oh, n equals infinity to infinity. Zero to infinity of cn x minus a to the n, where cn is f nth derivative of x over n factorial. So what we have to do is compute derivatives until we see a pattern. So we're going to go first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative. Hopefully, we'll see a pattern develop so we don't have to compute infinitely many. So you could write f0 of x if you want to. That'll be x to the negative first power. So first derivative of x, uh, of f of x. What's the derivative of x to the negative first? Yep, negative x to negative 2. Second derivative, so derivative of that derivative. So it'll be 2x to the negative 3. All right, third derivative. Yes, I'm going to write it as, well, almost. Yes, but I'm going to write it as negative 2 times 3 so we can see the pattern develop. It's tempting to just write 6. But then you may want to know where that 6 came from. So it came from 2 
times 3, not 3 plus 3. So it came from 2 times 3. <coughs> So fifth derivative, so don't say it out loud, just write it down. The pattern should be becoming obvious. So I'm not going to find the sixth derivative. The pattern should be becoming more clear. So we're going to go and just try to write the general derivative. So if, if we want the nth derivative. Anybody feeling brave want to take a stab at this? Sign alternates. So what do I need to make the sign alternate? Negative 1 to the n. Or n plus 1, depending. Let's try n, and then we'll see if that'll get the correct. So will that work? Is that positive when n is 0? Negative 1 to the 0 power is positive 1. Is it, is it negative when n is 1? So that'll work for the first derivative. How about second derivative? Positive. They're derivative negative. So it looks like our sign's going the right way. So that takes care of, so now we can ignore the negative part. So we'll just look at the positive parts. What about the numbers? What pattern is happening? It's factorial. So it is, so it's not quite n factorial because 5 wasn't 5 factorial. It was 1 lower. It was 4 factorial. 3 used... Oh, no. Uh-oh. We got a problem. So this should be the fourth derivative? Oh. So I'm demonstrating how you need to be careful because you mess up one place and it will spill out into other places. So it looks like just n factorial with this correction. Now what is 1 factorial? 1, so that still works. And 0 factorial? Also 1. All right, so they can just write. You don't need to wrap it up in parentheses, but I'm just going to do that to keep it separate. So any questions on the factorial part before we deal with powers of x? So the only thing left? x to powers. Now it's a little bit tricky because the 0 derivative doesn't have x to the 0 power. So it decreases by 1. So it's going to need to be something like x to the negative n. What do I have to do with negative n to get the actual correct power? The way I wrote it, it would be negative x minus 1, or negative n minus 1. Negative 4 minus 1 is negative 5, yeah. So a lot of times testing the first and the last one you wrote down will be good enough. Maybe one in between just to be safe. So 0 minus 1 is minus 1. That gets me x to the negative first. And then if I look at the last term I bother to compute, 4. Negative 4 minus 1 is negative 5. So first and last term match up. OK, questions on this? Right here. So this is the nth derivative. We got a nice form for the nth derivative. Generally, you're going to get a nice form. It may not feel that nice, but you'll get some form that's not too bad for the nth derivative. So this is what I call cn. Oh, no, nope, not quite. This is almost cn. What do I have to do to make this cn? Divided by n factorial. Divided by n factorial. Uh, and uh, I totally needed to put an a in here. You need to evaluate an a. You should not have x's hanging around. This should be a number. So this is fn of x. So let's go right down. cn is f 
n of a divided by n factorial. And r a, I said a is 2 somewhere. Yeah, so I have that little 2 written. So r a, we're going to expand around 2. Okay. So let's go ahead and compute fn of 2. All you're doing is replacing x by 2. There's nothing else going on. Just here was x right here, and then I replace it with 2. So I'm just going to turn that x into a 2. Negative 1 to the n, n factorial times 2 minus n minus 1. Because that's negative powers, you can write it in the denominator. So it'll be 2 to the n plus 1. Maybe that looks a little nicer than having negative powers hanging out. Yeah, I'll tell you what to what number to expand around. If for some reason I don't, I mean, if the only time you're going to do a problem for me on Taylor series is the final, so I'll be here for the final. But if the homework doesn't say it, which it should on all of them, they're probably talking about McLaurin series expanded around zero. So if it doesn't say a, the a value is probably they're probably somewhere in their written McLaurin series, which means expand around zero. Yeah, so that would be, that's basically just a Taylor series about zero. So if it's not obvious what A is, they're probably doing a McLaurin series with zero. So that is the numerator. Well, it's actually a fraction. So we got n factorial divided by 2n plus 1. Now the n factorial in the denominator, I'm going to squeeze in right there. So that's the extra, the extra part right there. Let me go right over it in blue. So that is the original, and don't forget this part, it's very important. That's that n factorial that came from the original denominator right there. So this was cn, had an n factorial in it already. So that's the n factorial that CN already had. So what algebra can we do? <coughs> Cancel the n factorials, and it will be even nicer. So our CN, our final version, negative 1 to the n divided by 2 to the n plus 1, which I could write 1 half times negative 1 half to the n. That seems like it works. Yeah, that'll work out. You don't have to rewrite in you know, different forms. You should definitely cancel the factorials whenever possible, but you don't have to rewrite that much. And we're ready to write the final version. T2 of x is summation c cn, n equals 0 to infinity, x minus a to the n. So our a was 2. So it's summation. This is our cn right here. 1 half times negative 1 half to the n times x minus 2 to the n. So this power series is specifically for this one function at x equals 2. This is the Taylor series for that function at x equals 2. And we saw how to compute it. Just take derivatives. What did we do back in power series? What was the big thing we did in power series? I mean, I defined what a power series was, but what did we do with them? We did what? Interval of convergence. So this doesn't work. This is not equal for every x. Actually, that's not true. This is equal. Equal. This does have radius of convergence, yes. So this only works for certain x's.
So this will be valid when it converges. So I'm not going to go back and compute interval of convergence. We did that before. You can do that. You're just going to use root or ratio. For this one, it won't matter which one you go with because a root test would be really nice right here. So I would do root test. That will be the fastest way to go on here. So you find interval of convergence. So once you use the root test, you'll get some row value, some interval, and then what do you have to do with that interval? I should say you'll get a radius centered at 2. Test the two endpoints. So it may converge on one side, may not converge on the other side, may converge on both sides, may diverge on both sides. So you have to decide, is it open, closed, or uh, at each side? So you'll do a regular test, and then you'll retest each endpoint. So you're basically going to have to do three tests whenever you determine interval of convergence. The general root ratio test, and then a different test for each end. Let's do sine. Sine derivatives are pretty easy. So this will be our second example. Find t0 of x. So find the series expansion of sine x. So what's the first thing you need to do to find Taylor series of sine? Derivatives. derivatives. So not only do you need to take a derivative, you need to take derivatives until you see a pattern. So take n derivatives. So I recommend probably five derivatives or so, and then you should see the pattern. So I want to warn you about finding the nth derivative. I would plug in 0. Once you know what the derivatives are, I would plug in 0 for the first uh, five derivatives and then find the pattern off of 0 as opposed to off of x, because you're going to have sines and cosines mixed together. But when you plug in 0, a lot of those are going to go away. So you'll have a nicer pattern if you plug in 0 before you try to find the nth term, the nth derivative. If you just find what's on the screen right here, things should make sense. It's not a good time to forget what sine of 0 and cosine of 0 are. Hopefully. Well, it's not the worst time to not forget right now. Your final exam will be the worst time to legitimately forget that.
you should get all your derivatives, hopefully, and then you're just going to get zero, one, or negative one, depending on. So all your sines are zero, all your cosines are either one or negative one, depending on if you're a negative cos or regular cos. So any questions on the numbers that are on the board before we try to put a general function in here? So unfortunately, you can't write every term as negative 1 to a power, because you can't write negative 1 to a power and get 0, even if you try to get really fancy with your power. So we're going to either have 0 or 1. So 0 on how could I, what type of n values get 0? Even. And does, if I just write n odd, does that work? We're going to do a guess and check here. Do I get the negative in the right place? Nope. I get negative in the wrong place. So how can I compensate? What's that? N minus 1 or N plus 1. Either way. So you want to shift it by 1. So I like positive, so I'll just go plus 1. But totally valid to do <coughs> minus 1 instead. So any questions on that function? OK, with that one? It's a little weird because half of our terms are going to be 0. So half of them are going to be missing. So we're going to do something when we write the actual summation down. So I'm just going to rewrite the CN. Oh, we actually need to write CN now. So CN is going to be 0 if n is even. If n is odd, it's going to be the original, negative 1 to the n plus 1, divided by n factorial. It's that fn is 0 divided by n factorial. So that is our C, CN right there. And that's n odd. Now, unfortunately, C ends a little bit ugly over here. So we're going to try to make it look nicer. So I only want odd odd values of n. So there's a few ways to do that. So instead of using n, what if I use 2n plus 1? So when n is 0, 2n plus 1 is 1. <coughs> when n is 1, 2n plus 1 is 3. When n is 2, 2n plus 1 is 5, 7, etc., etc. So, what I'm going to do instead of using n, I'm going to use 2n plus 1. So, I'm basically going to skip all the even ones by using 2n plus 1 right here. So, we're going to have negative 1. Now, this part will be tricky. I'll worry about the uh, power on negative 1 because that's not allowed to be odd every time. What happens if I write 2n plus 1 uh, plus 1? Always be even. And if I don't write that, always be odd. So I need to be careful about this power. This power needs to be both even and odd at different times. So I can't just stick 2n in there and then decide what to add or subtract off of that. So we're not allowed to do that. And x minus 0 to the 2n plus 1. So 
So now let's worry about the power. So when n equals 0, the first term, well, the first term is 0. But what about when n equals 0, this is the term we're really trying to start with here. So when n equals 0, I need it positive. This will make the brain hurt a little bit. The next term that's not 0, I need to be negative. And the next term after that will be positive, negative, positive, negative. So we can just put an n power up there. So that'll make our 0 term positive. Now I'm saying 0 and porting to 1. That's a little confusing. So when I say our zero term, I mean starting when n is zero, 2n plus 1 is 1, 2n plus 1 is 1. So when n equals zero, we're really dealing with the term, the first term that I circled up here. And this should be the uh, expansion of the sine function. So I don't know if I said this, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, but factorials are pow more powerful than exponents, so they'll always win in a race. So the fact that there's a factorial in the denominator means this will converge for all. If you run your test, this will converge. It'll have an infinite radius of convergence. So anytime you have factorial in the denominator, it basically will converge for all x values. So here's our sine x. So if this was confusing, when we shifted the index around a little bit, I recommend read the book. I think they either do sine or cosine in the book, one of the two. They got to do at least one of those two. If they don't do it, or if you don't like that explanation, where's another good place to go? YouTube. I'm sure somebody's expanded sine or cosine on YouTube and written out the Taylor series. Can you run through where you got CN and then went to summation? Yeah, so I had a problem. I didn't want to write down. <coughs> Uh, like a step function in here, but I noticed the pattern was kind of nice. It was zero for even, so I really just wanted the odd powers. So I knew a way to make an odd number if I have an integer is multiply by two and either add one or subtract one. I went with plus one because when n is zero, two n plus one is one. So that'll give me, when n is zero, that two n plus one is one, which is the first term I circled. The, the, I'll call it the one term up here. It will correspond to n equals zero in our sum, which is, that's the part that's a little bit weird. When n is one, you will actually be at the three term. And when n would be two, I'd be at the five term. So that's a little bit strange. We're, we're skipping the zeros, which are the even ones. So when n is 0, I wanted to really be working with the first term. When n is 1, I wanted the third term. When n is 2, I wanted the fifth term. And the way to get there is that whatever n is, we're going to double it and then add 1 to it. So I recommend do this for cosine. And you'll see something similar. It will be different, but it will be similar. And you'll have to do something really similar where half of them will be 0. And you have to figure out, all right, is it the even or the odds that are 0? Once I know that, then how do I write out either the even or the odd powers? So if I had to do evens, what would be a good thing instead of 2n plus 1, what would I do for evens? Just 2n. And then hopefully your 0 term will correspond to the 0. The 1 term will correspond to the 2 term. The 2 term will correspond to the 4 term. Etc. Etc. So you'll skip all your odds. That's one way to get cosine. What could I do to this sine expansion to get cosine? Without going through that whole process of taking all those derivatives and and figuring out cn and all that fun stuff. Derivative. derivative. What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. cosine. So as long as you treat both sides fairly. Remember math, just like communism, you got to treat both sides of your equation fairly, or else you don't have an equation. So as long as I take derivative of both sides, 
it'll still be equal. So go ahead, take derivative of both sides. I'll do the left side. So we're going to take uh, d dx of both sides. So we're going to get cosine x equals The, side, the derivative you have to take is very easy, though. Why? So I'm allowed to push the derivative inside the sum from the sum rule. Why can I push the derivative past? No. Why can I push the derivative past that term? So the term's got n's, but what does it not have? X's. So our derivative says this is constant. Our deriv derivative doesn't care. So that's the constant right there. So it's a constant multiple rule. So take that derivative, you can do it. Derivative questions, that should have been pretty painless. What algebra can I do? So I can cancel the biggest term in the factorial with a 2n plus 1. So if you want to get fancy and use notation, unfortunately, you can't really do this by crossing out. Because what you're going to be left with is 2n factorial, not I can't just cross out the factorial sign because that's not the part that cancels. So I recommend don't try to get fancy and cross stuff out. Just rewrite it as it should be. So I know stuff's going to cancel, but there's not really a classy way to like reduce an exponent by 1 or something like that. There's not a nice way. I'd have to cross it out and rewrite 2n factorial on the bottom. So there's not a nice way to cancel here. And a warning about factorials. If I just write 2n exclamation point, do I mean to factorialize the n or the 2n? So that's a little ambiguous. So you want to be careful. I think if you do not write parentheses, factorial just modifies whatever is just to the left of it. So I believe that the first one I wrote down would be what it actually equals. But if you write it without parentheses, I will take it to mean you're factorializing the n, not the quantity 2n. So just be a little careful. And especially on web work, there'll be a big difference between 2n factorial versus 2 times n factorial. So we don't have time to do it now, but I strongly recommend take cosine and to go the long way around to get the Taylor series. And make sure you know the answer now, but make sure that you actually get here. Anybody have textbook with them today? Do you have it? All right, so I want to find out where the common, there's a bunch, there's probably eight or 10 common Taylor series. It's probably in the Taylor series section, which is 10.8. I want to get the actual, the exact place in the book of where they are.
Yeah. How many? Yeah. What page? What page is that? Which one? So we're gonna go page six o two. And what is is it like table ten point? So that'll be frequent or common Taylor expansions. They probably assign a cosine in there, I'm sure, and e to the x, and then a whole bunch of other ones. All right, so that's a good thing to bring with you in your cheat sheet if you can squeeze it in there. That could save you some time. So before we break for the day, let's do, so we know cosine, I'll put a box around this. Did we get cosine and sine correct? Now that you're looking at the correct answers, hopefully we did. It's a lot of work to be wrong. <laughs> Waste 45 minutes. It just means your uh, works for any real number. This right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to find the Taylor series for uh, centered at a equals zero uh, of cosine of 3x squared. So taking repeated derivatives would be pretty painful. You get the chain rule, and then you'd have product rule, and then you have chain product chain, and it would be really bad, right? So let's be smart. Let's use what I put a box around. What's the difference between cosine x and cosine of 3x squared? 3x squared replaces x. So everywhere you see x, all you have to do is put it in 3x squared. Doesn't take any more thinking than that. So I can write equals, I'm just going to copy everything down, but careful where I have x. So what I put a box around, that needs to be 3x squared. Oh, I totally forgot summation. That's pretty important. And depending on what you're doing, if this is a final exam question, or even a web board question, you wouldn't have to simplify it. You, of course, how do you deal with powers of powers? Multiply. Multiply bases, add powers. Powers of powers are products. So this is a 4n power right here. So you could, now you have to also be careful, it's going to be 3 squared x to the 4n. So that's a really good reason to not um, rewrite it. So just leave it the way you get it. Web work should take this answer unsimplified like this right here. And I would take this answer as well. So I don't want to see you mess up simple algebra when you don't have to be doing simple algebra.